ahead and get started. Um, I think there's a signing sheet going around, so make sure that everybody signs in that's here today. Um, we have lots of new faces, so we're going to do some introductions around the room. I'm Jenny Morgan, I'm Chair of Bear Creek Watershed Council and Stormwater Program Manager for Rogue Valley Sewer Services. Laura Hodnett, I'm with Medford Water Commission, I'm the Treasurer of the Council. Jamie Stevens, I'm the Science Director at Klamath Bird Observatory. Steve Mason with the WISE Project. John Roberts, uh, Oregon Water Resources Commission, I'm representing this area, and Chair of the Commission, and with uh, Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. Roger Jones, City of Medford, Public Works. Linda Acosta, I'm with the Irrigation District, this is a patron. Yeah, Reverend Griffiths, Freshwater Trust. Craig Tess, this is Rose Valley Council of Governments. Oh, uh, Chuck Corson, uh, Volunteer for the Fair Creek Watershed Council. Rolf Cross, interested patron, I guess. And Robert Coffin, a water resource consultant and currently the interim president of the New Road Basin Partnership. Eric Dinner, SRU, and Catalyst Incorporated. Charles Lane, Southern Oregon University. Kate Jackson, Department of Environmental Quality and Regional Liaison. Rob Morris, City of Athens. Rachel Worling, OC Extension and Resources Extension. Moritella, Soil and Water, and uh, Treasurer. Oh, sorry, I'm the Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> you can have the Treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Francis O. Young, I'm the Fair Creek Watershed Council Coordinator. Our presentation this morning is on the Gold Ray Dam Removal Monitoring Results. Um, Craig's going to, I'm guessing, lead off? Yes? Yep. Okay. For those of you that came last month, this is going to be kind of a same thing. I'm going to just give a brief introduction and then turn it over to the folks that uh, actually have the information. Again, my name is Craig Tess. I work for the Rogue Valley Council of Governments. Back in 2009, I retired from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Craig Harper talked me into coming down and starting to work for RV Cog because he wanted somebody that could help monitor the removal of Gold Ray Dam. At that time, it was being talked about as a possibility. So since then, I've been involved in being the lead for the monitoring group, dealing with studying the effects of removing Gold Ray Dam on the, on the Rogue River. Gold Ray Dam came out in August, and early fall of 2010, we did one year of pre-dam removal monitoring. That funding was uh, provided by the National Marine Fisheries Service. It was federal funding that came down to the Open Rivers Initiative. That funding also provided two years of post-dam removal monitoring. At that time, the funding was uh, reduced uh, due to federal budget reductions and we got we were able to get another year's worth of monitoring from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. So this monitoring effort was covered by federal and state monitoring dollars. Uh, and it amounted to about three and a half years of monitoring of this project. Part of the of the uh, program you're hearing about today deals with the wetland and groundwater monitoring that SOU and Catalyst did. But I want to also mention that we had other uh, entities looking at removal of the dam. Uh, Klamath Bird Observatory did some work to see how this affected uh, the spring bird uh, occurrence along the former uh, Kelly Slough area. Uh, we also had Oregon State <coughs> University. They were able to monitor the effects of sediment movement down to the reservoir, all the way down to um, the mouth of the Applegate. So they were able to tie this in with the removal of Savage Rabbit Dam. Those reports and the information is available on the RV COG website. We have a link to the RV COG or to the uh, Gold Ray Dam monitoring project. And if you want uh, to get some more information, talk to me after this. Thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to Eric Gitmer. Thanks, 
Craig. I have to say, by the way, that the liaison effort by Craig uh, with a myriad of agencies and all of the other participants to get this done uh, was very much appreciated. And if the products that we have received from all of the work um, are largely due uh, in part now uh, its coordination to uh, Craig. Uh, so the, obviously the, what we're trying to do here is to uh, get a sense of how the environmental changes have uh, resulted in the removal of the, uh, removal of the dam. Uh, Craig mentioned the, who the researchers were. Uh, so from uh, early spring of 2010 to uh, 2014, uh, we've had uh, about four years worth of work. Um, Craig mentioned funding support. Um, some adjustments had to be made. You know, we have this wonderful plan of how we're going to go about doing things, uh, and then find out that oh, maybe that won't work, uh, or the results or um, quality testing didn't end up with kind of information that you thought you'd get. And so we've had some adjustments along the way, and we'll talk about one of them that having to do with wetland hydraulics in a minute. So. This is a final draft of the report. is now in process. It's being reviewed by OWIF. Um, and so, uh, as Craig mentioned, it's on a website uh, at RBCOG. If you have comments, please uh, let us know. So, thank you. Uh, so, for SOU's uh, function, was the geomorphology, how did the land change? Um, not just the river, you know, do erosion patterns. Obviously, you take the dam out, you're going to increase the gradient, you're going to increase the erosion potential. And so what happened on the mainstream of the road? But also, what happened in the wetlands? Uh, we have found that it's more than just, quote, the anticipated drying out. There are other dynamics that happen in what we call the wetland complex, uh, which included uh, Tolo and Kelly Slough. Uh, groundwater roll, uh, that is a part of the hydrologic setting of the system. Uh, what will groundwater do as the system dries out? But uh, it turns out it's a source of some of the water that remains in the system. Uh, water quality, obviously. How will the dewatering of the wetland complex affect water quality there? And that connection wetland complex of the Rogue River was certainly worth investigating. Um, and then wetland hydraulics. Turns out that the system didn't dry completely. And there are some benefits to the fact that there remains a, a water budget, uh, especially in Kelly Slough and Kelly Creek. Yeah. Um, so uh, we looked at and found the physical changes on the main stem. Uh, we had increasing erosion. Um, especially, obviously, during high water, which is when most of the erosion happens. But we also looked at sedimentation that happened along the main stem of the road, and there were new gravel bars that showed up, and uh, the movement of the gravel as the river gradient increased. Um, and how did the wetland complex change? What's happening now with Kelly Creek as it goes through the old Kelly Slough wetland and into the Rogue River. And uh, North Channel, which we call Kelly Creek now, um, still has standing water in it, even uh, at, during drought conditions like right now. And it was that's somewhat unexpected. Okay. So uh, geomorphology, um, wetted area changes. This is the slide before. The dam is still in. And so this is Kelly Creek. Kelly Slough, Toa Slough, and the main road river, Bear Creek. This was uh, taken before the dam was removed. Okay. Um, we were able to combine the aerial photographs. These are ortho digital high resolution aerial photographs, thanks to David Smith and Associates out of Portland, with LIDAR information that was already available. And combining the two, you see low areas, elevation. This is elevation now. Uh, relatively low areas downstream and higher areas upstream. But notice, too, that we have 
uh, well-defined channels. This one is a, uh, I guess you would say a poorly defined channel, but a channel nevertheless um, that was part of our sampling. And so, um, again, pretty strong ridges here that help control the dynamics of the Rogue River. By the way, we had historical photographs of the Rogue, and I think Steve Mason played a role in this, where it showed the Rogue River actually coming right through this. This is a mid-channel distributory environment where the Rogue River did in fact meander back and forth over historical time. And so, uh, who knows, it may do it again. Okay. Um, so now we're looking at the comparison between 2010 and 2013. Um, the uh, areas of uh, wetted areas in 2013, wetted areas in 2010. Um, some of the uh, concern areas, here's erosion. Uh, this is on land at Dalton Spouse leases, and but we have uh, new erosion areas here, here. Those are the ones that are the most obvious if you're on a boat in the river. This is what you're seeing. Um, and uh, some changes along where Bear Creek came in, some new gravel bars uh, as a result of increased um, erosion and breathe. Just jump in. Probably the biggest thing to us uh, about this was these two areas that Eric mentioned. There's definitely the, this big sinuous meander scouring in over here and then crossing over the channel and coming over on that side of, over there. If any of you've been down the creek, you've probably down the creek, down the road, you've probably seen that spot. Uh, much credit here is to Paul Blanton, one of our SRU team members, they're doing this analysis. He was able to combine the ortho digital group with LIGAR to create these images. <coughs> Other thing to notice is 2010 is yellow orange. We still had Kelly Creek uh, wet all the way down to that far. 2013, Eric, you want to show? Kelly Creek still wet up in there, but the, the downstream end ends right up there at the top. What's that? Right. So uh, we actually have um, the quantification of the new exposed acreage. The largest changes uh, before and after the dam was removed, if that makes sense. But you don't just measure your uh, increased exposed sediment after the one year, we you know we have four years of data, and so the exposed acreage actually went down a little bit as the hydraulics adjusted within the system. Um, this is the main step. Um, the uh, Kelly Slough, uh, obviously the exposed um, uh, the, the acres um, changed pretty drastically, decreased, and in 2013. Uh, the other major decrease in wetted area uh, was was expected. Was that was that another decrease, another four percent? Yes. Or another four acres? Yes. In addition. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, role and influences of groundwater. This is a system that Robert set up. So switching so over. Uh, Switching over, I, I wanted to first of all mention that I'm going to move rather quickly through some of this because our findings and our recommendations are always what people like to talk about, and the whole report is available. So what you're seeing is all in the final report, and I uh, just wanted to let you know because I'm cognizant of our time frame at the Bear Creek Watershed Council meetings. So some of this you've already seen. And if it seems new to some of you, please bear with me and you can certainly go back to the report. What we did was we set up a bunch of stations to look at the shallow groundwater with these things called bosometers. Uh, so one goes in really deep, by deep I mean maybe 10 feet, the other one maybe a couple of feet. And when you look at the different water levels over time, you can tell, is the groundwater moving up? Is it moving down? Is 
is moving one direction or the other. And you monitor those and you can learn quite a bit about what's going on in the wetland. We had six of these stations. So this is again just to show you the areas. There was one in Tolo Slough right here. I'm going backwards on my numbers. There was one over in Kelly Slough right over here. We called it Zomber Nest 5, PN5. Then we moved upstream to where some of the water maybe is running off over here. Maybe it's affected by the slough. We weren't sure. Uh, we found a wetland area up here, a little higher up um, elevation-wise from the rest. What's going on with that? Is it does it behave differently than the rest? Same thing over here. And then up here at the upstream end where that channel is, that channel that seemed to be deeper than everywhere else that we're calling Kelly Creek. Those are our six stations. So for example, PN1, the one that's upstream where the channel is, this is just to kind of explain how it works. These are water levels. So this is the standing water level where we put that. that you'd be standing in water at this elevation. But the water level in the three pisometers that were right around there, you notice the water level in those is a little higher than the water level that they're actually plugged into. And what that tells us is groundwater is trying to move up. It's contributing, it's providing water to the wetland at pisometer nest one. That was real interesting because it doesn't happen everywhere else. The water we learned was also quite a bit colder and made us think about, oh, there's a contribution from a spring or some seep or something like that that's providing the hydraulics for some of the wetland complex. Okay, this one we just have one example. Now let's track that over time. So if you remember, PN5 was way down there in Kelly Slough where we drained it, okay? and these two bars, the blue and the red, if you look over here during the dates, if you can see it, they were both measured before the dam breached. Notice that after the dam breached, we don't even have any readings for the shore, the shallow, or the surface water. The bottom just drained out of the wetland. Not a surprise, but very different from that other one I showed you at PN1. However, how interesting that the deep pisometer, we still got water in that. And so over there at PN5, there's still water that is contributing to some extent to the wetland plants and the hydrology. But notice how the water level is slowly dropping over time. This last reading was taken uh, last fall, 9-20-2013. Is that trend still continuing? Don't know, but it, it kind of looks like it, doesn't it? The wetland itself could still be slowly draining. Here's what I'm talking about. PN5, that this man, Bob Podesta here and Eric, they're reaching over to one of those pisometers to measure it. Okay, the wetland drains. That's right after, that's it. You see that, that's, uh, that's just seven, this is July. This is August 24th. Then we look again. And this is the same area uh, in 2013 when we still had water down deep in the area there. Um, so a lot more about the hydraulics that is in the report about that. But moving on to water quality now, we basically looked at uh, field parameters uh, as we went out to the sites, pH, temperature, conductivity. And one time we collected, we had enough money funding to look at just some basic major ions. And I'm not gonna go through all of that because some of it wasn't too exciting. And we have other things that is kind of exciting, that are kind of exciting. So let's move it into temperature. Of all those things, we're just gonna cover temperature today. Um, this is just a spot check with a thermometer because I, something that jumped out at us is okay, a hot day in July, uh, 2010, notice the Rogue River temperature is about 16 degrees centigrade, and a lot of the wetlands about the same, not surprisingly. And Tolo Slough, much warmer, water kind of off channel, hanging out there quite a bit hotter. And over in here, this wetland that's up all by itself, quite hot. But look at the 
this low temperature here where I mentioned that spring existed. It's at 10.2. That, that's a little more information that helped to support that we had this contribution of water. So this big old wetland complex um, is complex. <laughs> so these, this is just spot check with a thermometer, which as most of you know that take that, that, that fluctuates so much even during the day. So what we also did is we took these little data logger thermographs and we put them down at the bottom of all these nests and we just let them monitor every 15 <coughs> minutes for a season. And you don't have to read all of this, but looking at the blue lines, here's that PN1 again. And this is, this is, says 10 degrees right there. Look at that, con this is through the whole summer. Look at this constant temperature being recorded in the wetland area all along here. And interestingly, <coughs> right here, we sent our surveyor out. And the surveyor had to cut open some of the trees over there so he could get some satellite imageries to come in. And look what the temperature started to do. As soon as we opened up that canopy of trees, little change in the temperature, little, went up a little higher, which to me lends some support to how important it is the tree canopy is to water quality uh, and temperature in particular. <coughs> then as the season goes, um, right here is probably where the thermograph or data logger actually went dry. And here's the dam breach. Now, following that along to a couple of the other ones, you see they behave very differently. Even though they're submerged underwater, there's this fluctuation every day when it's from noon to midnight. And you see this diurnal fluctuation. And then you see how there's a gentle increase as, as uh, the, the weather gets warmer. And then if for PN2, it's real obvious when that thermograph is laying down in there underwater, when it finally goes dry and the sun comes out <coughs> and just starts to cook it. And there's a real obvious, like the day it happens, you can really tell that on the thermograph. So you see they're all different and we needed to interpret the data from all these. Here's the three that are down, further down to, towards um, the downstream end. Remember PN5, which was in Kelly Slough, and PN6, which was in Tolo Slough. And again, the, uh, the thing here I just wanted to point out is you sure can tell when your thermographs, you don't have to be out there to see, oh, they should, uh, they're exposed now when, when we see this this change right here. So that's it for just sharing with you a little bit about the temperature and our water quality <coughs> parameters. So now we're going to cover some of the other wetland hydraulics that we looked at. And I'm just going to remind you all, this is part of a bigger puzzle that Craig talked about. There's a lot of other people doing other research and monitoring out here to look at what happens when you remove a dam and you got a wetland around it. And are they all the same or not? And all those questions. So we're looking at these things here. Uh, we, I mentioned that Kelly Creek um, started to flow. Well, nobody even knew it would continue to do that. So we actually started to monitor the flow and um, have already submitted two or three reports that are posted at the uh, RBCOG online about that. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that. I will show you one thing on the map. So here's the map again, and here's, here's this thing we're calling Kelly Creek. And at each of these stations, F4 for flow 4, just take a look at each of these stations. The first number in each spot is the flow we measure in cubic feet per second. So at this time frame, we had standing water upstream over here where that spring was. It wasn't really flowing at all. We couldn't measure it. However, we just had some rain. And here, I mean, we were getting 23 cubic feet per second flowing into this wetland, right? Let's go down to the bottom of the wetland where the water is flowing out of Kelly Creek into the road. <coughs> it's flowing out at 7.3 cubic feet per second. So where's all this water going? Where's the 23 cubic feet per second going? It's not going out at the bottom. 
you know, we surmise that this is a, a way that the water is recharging the whole wetland complex from time to time. And it doesn't just go down the creek, it kind of splays out and, and fills in different areas of the wetland. And exactly where? Well, we don't know. But there's obviously a problem with the mass balance between those two. And if you track upstream a little bit, these two are very similar. So we feel comfortable with our, our accuracy of that. Um, slowly, Kelly Creek did slowly dry out. The other uh, numbers show that. And the question remains, uh, how much of that is due to this wetland sponge just slowly leaking back out? And how much of it still occurs every year when we have high precipitation events? Like this one. You guys remember December 2nd, 2012? We had a peak discharge on the road at 38,000 CFS right at noon. We got some folks in the air, all of us excited, volunteers, just uh, uh, Charlie Rogers from over in Josephine County got his plane out. We were flying around. It was terrible. It was very scary. You wouldn't want to be there. We weren't having fun at all. <laughs> and, uh, I was on the ground while my daughter and Eric were up in the air with uh, him, and uh, we were filming this. And again, I'd love to show you all the photos. Some of you have already seen them, but we need to get through our report summary. So this part, yes sir? Question on that, when you were showing that flow, during that time in December, we had seven continuous days of that flow, where it almost it, it was ranging even further down downstream on the river. I was getting in a couple of places, 34 to 36,000 CFS and I was coming off of creeks. Okay. And so, I know I came to the NRAC meeting and I was there when you guys did the other presentation. But uh, I, it was interesting to see that and knowing what it cut away, um, that we did have almost almost seven full days of that flow. Everybody heard that. This was not a little quick 20 minute event. This been the same, so many, many days. Seven, seven of solid, solid days. And this is actually down at uh, near Nugget. It's down near Gold. Well, some of you are here from Goldville. You might know this spot much better than me, but it was a great spot to take the picture. Plus, I like the fact that the little kid was in there just, just like me. I mean, I, I felt like that guy right there when I was taking the picture. So, um, oh, and the, so there's one of the photos. Just, just again, to kind of entice you, this is that downstream area where the erosion took place. This is that scour area. This is where that creek jumps across to the other side and is scouring up in here. Here is Kelly Slough all being refilled again. Interesting how Kelly Creek is flowing in here. It looks like it's actually flowing this way and filling the slough up before it ultimately flows down in here. So we had a whole photo suite of this and a whole presentation about this. Uh, I have a question. Is there a connection between the river for fish to rear off channel? Uh, well, during the high during the high flow, then I guess um, during low flow, yes, right here, there's a definite channel um, opening okay. to allow fish. But on the upstream end, there isn't. And we're going to cover that in a minute. How that might be uh, important or, or of interest to people later on. So a little bit more about that. Here's a flood event graph that shows on the road river at a particular USGS gauge, what the USGS thinks is a 100-year event. They believe that a 100-year flood event is about, whatever this shows, about 140,000 cubic feet per second. So where were we when, as this man said, we had those six, six or seven days? 38,200, the USGS plugs that in between a two-year event and a five-year event. Just so you can put that into perspective. Now I'm bringing this up because we wanted to know, as you might have been asking over there, sir, is, well, when does the Rogue River get high enough to just flow back into that whole wetland complex? That was fascinating us. How can we find out? We guessed be, by, through our geomorphology and stuff that it's probably around 9,000 CFS. So that's why this is in here. And that's important because 
that's frequent. That's less than a two-year event that, you know, could be happening every year, more or less. And that's just another, uh, this shows the USGS graph uh, right there. That it just shows the peak up there at 38,000 feet. And as I just said, when does the road overflow into the wetland complex? This is a photo from the upstream end. So here's the road river flowing downstream, same time this December event. And look at all the water that's flowing into that, that channel and then goes into this big wetland complex. We wanted to know, well, okay, that happens at 38,000, but how often does it happen? I mean, is this something we can count on to rehydrate this wetland area once in a while for people that care? How would this affect for um, the other wildlife in there? And so on. So what we did is we went back over there and we took a profile of this area, just surveyed in a profile to figure out, well, first of all, what does this look like? And you're looking at this profile here. Here's the Rogue River. As we walk along, here's the elevation of the gravels. And we put in some new, this is where Eric said we changed our mind a little bit and tweaked our work based on what we were learning about. So we put in these thermograph data logger nests. There was a little bit of standing water, just like the one that might have been maybe right in there, some of that standing water, who knows. And then we finally walked through over to Kelly Creek. And the, the little dotted red lines are our water. So this just one of the things, if you look at this, is 1150 to 1155. So one of the things that jumps out at me is if you really wanted to open up the Rogue River to Kelly, what do we got there? About three feet high of alluvial material that would have to be removed. Or if you're worried the other way, wow, we want to protect the area, well, there's only three feet standing in your way. And that we found rather interesting. And this is in real distance, too. It looks like Kelly Creek is about from 30 feet to 300 feet. So that's, what, 270 feet away from the Rogue River proper. So you wouldn't have to move too much if you wanted to look at that off-channel habitat that you brought up. Well, I'm just wondering, is it potentially important habitat in that whole complex for fish? Probably a good question for a lot of people in here. We, we uh, tend to think it is, especially since there's some cold water refuge sure. in there. Mm -hmm. Especially since, as Eric mentioned earlier, geomorphologically, it, the channel used to be there anyway. It's not like you're introducing some a dreadful flood issue, and it also moves the channel away from uh, the uh, gravel ponds and some of those areas that got eroded away. You would tend to reduce the energy gradient of these big flow events. Um, I think I'm going to skip through this. We, well, I can't skip through this. Um, so, what we did, Jenny. You're rolling your eyes? Okay, we are going to skip through this. <laughs> I know we look at it when I need to be Okay, we figured out a way to use thermographs to calculate or estimate how high or low the flow needed to be on the Rogue River. So don't try to follow me here. These are the two important numbers that we believe, and it's all in the report, that the Rogue River flows into Kelly Creek at about 7200 to 8230 CFS. Somewhere in there is where we re-wet the wetland complex from the Rogue River. The other thing to mention before we get into our final findings is definitely different veg changes. We took 360 degree videos around. If anybody wants to look at these, they're posted at the website. But down near PN1, down at the lower end, we have now, at two, 2013, some pretty stressed canopy vegetation. Now just compare that to the area up where there's continual standing water up at the, up at the northern part and the um, eastern part. So um, this could be something that's still occurring, but there's clearly a difference in where the trees are stressed and where they're not stressed. And that brings us to findings. Eric, I don't know if you 
want to blitz through these? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, geomorphological changes. Uh, again, the, the most drastic changes happen right after the dam removal. That just makes sense. Uh, then erosion and meanders uh, along the Rogue River continue um, and will still continue. Uh, and again, geology, Brooks, hydrology, we'll say right after or during flood events. That's where your highest energy is and it will continue to happen. Um, we still see bank erosion from the main stem of the road. Uh, no. Uh, 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 dewatered initially, but also um, it's uh, the two years of our data affirm or confirm that uh, it's still adjusting. Um, and uh, Kelly Slough is about half of its length, but it's a huge dynamic change now to wet and dry sea. Um, Kelly Slough remains connected to the Rogue River. And uh, both in the upstream and downstream, it's an ephemeral stream. And you're looking at Kelly Slough as being ephemeral as well. Uh, the connectivity, uh, allows us to look at the potential for management of the hydrology in the area. Um, and that bank erosion will, of course, continue to affect sediment uh, load along the road. Um, and it's a local concern to landowners, such as Dalton Strauss here, who um, rents one of the, the land that's uh, being affected. And, uh, our techniques to show the geomorphology changes using LIDAR and um, high resolution digital photography, that system works and it can be very, very precise. Um, so, findings of a large areas of the wetland complex receive water from several sources. Surface runoff, table rocks, between the table rocks. Uh, direct precipitation, that doesn't change. Uh, overflow from the Rogue River, uh, periodic, can be relatively large amounts. As you mentioned, that last event uh, was uh, several days in duration. And uh, groundwater, consistent, relatively small amount, localized, but also Mark Robert noted that some of that groundwater has cold water potential, which uh, could be a refugia situation since it's so close to the upper end of any pool of the road river. Um, open waters persist. Kelly Creek still has standing water. Uh, cold water refugia about 200 feet from the road river. Um, uh, the system is still adjusting. It will continue to adjust. It is a dynamic system. Uh, so Kelly Creek is ephemeral. Uh, it, oh, from, from the mouth, um, as it enters the Rogue River at the lower end near where the dam was, headward erosion, incision is happening. Um, but the planting, by the way, uh, many of you participated in the planting of that area. Uh, you should see the, uh, the success of the willows, uh, even in the areas that are um, uh, having uh, headward erosion, the willows, trees, made it very successful, very impressive. Uh, uh, slowly filling with invasive um, species. We didn't do a specific study on this. Um, the, the concern is still there about invasive species. Uh, native planting. <coughs> on uh, Kelly Creek and in fact uh, along the road uh, along the Bear Creek. Very, very successful. Um, this last point is uh, what we think is maybe pivotal. The wetland complex, when you have high water and high water from the road is entering the wetland complex, that high water is not going down the main channel which reduces the erosion potential during high water periods. And uh, 
allow, it, it actually reduces the impact of main stem flows uh, on erosion uh, in the system. Uh, the other benefit, obviously, it brings, high, brings water into the Kelly Slough area, which I think ecologically is a good thing. Uh, implications of what we've done. Well, uh, it's hard to tell, and, I, and we don't know exactly how many situations where you take out a dam also has a significant impact on the ecological system caused by the dam. A lot of times it's just open water. But many of you know that the, the major controversy about taking out this dam in discussions in 2009, in discussions in 2010, was, and many of you were at these public meetings, What's going to happen to that wonderful ecological Kelly Slough when you take the dam out? Well, everybody suspected the kinds of things that would happen. And those of you who actually canoed back there and found it so valuable that you didn't tell anybody else, <coughs> really were worried about how wonderful that system was, even though it's artificially created. So how many other areas where dam removals are considered will also allow for the evaluation of an ecological change when you take out the dam. I don't know how many, but uh, I am convinced that the kinds of research that happened, and not just what SRU did, but what Klamath Bird Observatory, uh, Observatory did, and I think, Jamie, continuing to do, you still do Christmas bird counts there? Um, there's some monitoring still going on, very much reduced from the first two years post yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so there's still. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, recommendations. Uh, obviously, we'd like to continue to uh, monitor the, uh, this at some point. Uh, resources uh, allowed. Uh, to monitor of erosion and sedimentation. Quantify existing and potential inflow from the road to the wetland complex. Why do that? Well, not only to find out when and more precisely how it happens, but there may be some benefits. This is public land now. It has better public access than before. Jackson County is responsible for you know, the recreational potential of this land. And you're looking at trails. And if you were going to do a master plan for increased recreation in this area, you'd want to put the trails which would attract to water features, history, um, and wildlife, and vegetation, interpretive signs. Well, having a, a, a ability to say to Jackson County, uh, this is the hydrologic situation now. And you might think about your trail system to complement what we have found with regard to changing the water system and um, the changes in open areas. Um, and vegetation, we noted there are some stresses because you re reduce groundwater, reduce hyd hydrologic flow, and um, determining the ecological benefits of increasing the flow into the wetland complex. Uh, we did not do that specifically. Uh, Climate Bird Observatory with uh, bird counts uh, have determined uh, much of this. Their reports uh, were already turned in, and hopefully we'll have some continuing data there. But as you know, the birding species are indicator species of the overall ecological health, as anything else is. And so their work will be uh, supported. Uh, The okay, the pre-monitoring before the dam went out established what the wetland looked like at that time. The HDR, there was a great wetland delineation done by HDR with acres, types of wetlands, and so on. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, systematically or, or characteristically, I mean, when you're doing this, the removal of the dam, I was kind of surprised because I've watched both, both Savage Rapids and Golden Gray, given the years and the time. According to federal regulations and the state regulations, 
they were to have done a five-year study on the wetlands before they removed that dam, it didn't. As I talked to the Corps of Engineers and I talked to the Department of Reclamation, it never got started. And they're supposed to follow up with five years after to see what the cause and effect was. One example, when they took out Savage Rapids, we had two families of bald eagles. They have gone, they have not come back. And we had some offspring and some others. Specifically, they have not come back since the year they took the dam out. That was the finish. I don't know about over there on Gold Ray, and I've, I've seen it several times. I'm out there in the field doing the other stuff because my concern was when they did the, the removal, everybody talked about how the water was going to be there. The company out of, was it Eugene or somewhere up there that came down that was supposed to do? River Design Group. River, River Design Group. They were supposed to be out there doing the course and the other examinations. When they said, and it blew me away, they said there was no wetlands around Gold Ray. Now that's their words at those meetings. There, there was no existent wetland. Now, our biggest problem now with this, how it's moved, is going to be the percolation, because the percolation throughout those, that area, through the slough and all, is going to be determining how cold or cool that water stays. It's not with the flow, it's the percolation through those different sands and sediments. That's what's going to keep that water cool for those fish. I don't think at all. That's not, this is not my expertise. I do a hazmat and the full chemicals and the things that I found behind the dam and what went on. I question that, even though the cores were done properly. I guess one last question that I didn't mean to take so much of your time. When you guys did the monitoring, this monitoring that you were doing as far as water flows and in and out and through the sloop, was any part of that done close to where those 12 cores that were done uh, to see what kind of movement evidence of the material that they did, excuse me, that they did find behind the, the gold gray? I mean, there were 12 cores they said they took. To me, it would have been a good idea if you did monitoring to be close to those cores where those cores were drawn because of the amount and the types of soils and sediments and whether or not the percolation got better or worse. Obviously, if it gets worse, you're going you're gonna to lose all your cool temperatures that you need for the fish. And then they talked about that chiller that they were going to do because of the sewer treatment plant. It's only going to change it a half a degree. Eric, you were there for that. I don't yeah. think the yeah. monitoring was closed. No, no, it wasn't. I think most of those cores were uh, above the dam along your main stem, and our efforts were in the sloop, so they did not coincide with the uh, I, I was concerned that when they came in, when, they, when we were out there at the ODA, when they came in and did the first round, they said that theoretically there were no wetlands. Uh, you got endangered species up and down there and under the Endangered Species Act. You will do those samples. You will do that that follow-up. And you guys, for money to take care of, uh, advising to, to keep following this up, that money is provided by NOAA. It has to be there because of the endangered species in that river. So they have to do a five-year study. Consequently, they didn't do it before, but they have to do it after at least five years. And they have to provide you guys with the money if you're going to be the only ones doing it. Um, we're out, out of time, although I, I appreciate your comments, and maybe we can talk a little bit afterwards. Um, acknowledgements, you, you don't do these things just at the SOU, um, and these are the folks that contributed to uh, the success of this effort. Uh, Noah and all of our organization, Arkansas, of course, DEQ provided those data loggers. Uh, USGS with their monitoring of the gauging station. Um, of course, Jackson County. Uh, David Smith and Associates did the aerials. Uh, Stephen Barrett land surveying. So we have absolute sea level that, um, uh, data for all of our sampling points. Um, Nature Conservancy allowed us on their land. Um, Charlie Rogers did the airplane, uh, allowed us to fly over. Tiffany, of course, is Robin's daughter who is helping this. Uh, Bob Odessa provided the boat so we can go up and down the river. Craig Tuss, of course, and Dalton Strauss, not the least of the uh -oh. 
Watch out, though. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you yeah. folks know Dolph. And I know you're not asking. Suppose that liquor in the seal. <laughs> 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 but you, you folks. Let me just make sure you didn't pop the cork yet. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, is married to this land, grew up at this land, celebrated the land with the damning place, uh, was not in favor of its removal, but also uh, had keys to the best access that you could have to get boats in and out of the water, and lost the boat ramp twice because of the erosion we just talked about. But in my experience with him over the last 30 years, uh, he is one of my best examples of a class act. He allowed everyone to have keys and access to places where we could get to the river to do the monitoring. It didn't matter what kind of monitoring you were doing. I mean, um, and to have him do that, um, it, it's another example of why he is a very, very statewide respected person. And Dalton, thank you. Well, thank you guys. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but I hope that you guys will stick around until af afterwards. Maybe we can come talk to you then. I know we have a lot of people coming specifically for your presentation. Okay. We will move on to the Larson Creek Fish Passage update from Steve, who's here today. All right. Uh, you're going to get a hopefully a good presentation on this probably two uh, to three months from now. Um, the construction, four years after we uh, initially applied, is finally underway. Uh, there were two sites. Uh, the Ellendale site is, I'm going to say it's done. Uh, yeah. And wow. if you've been out there, it really does Chris. look pretty good. Um, if you look at the first baffle, so we lifted the stream. Uh, we then put some baffles in there as well so there'd be depth because in most flows there was just a couple inches of water in the culvert. Uh, the one thing that's going to be redone is that lowest baffle. Uh, it was cut too short, it's about four inches short on either end so they're going to recut it. Right now they got some rock in there. It's a minor issue. Other than that, it looks really good uh, and you can actually really get a good sense of the, the new flood, uh, the reconnected flood plane. Uh, previously the incision had been causing some issues there. Uh, Black Oak is still under construction. We're on time with the construction. Uh, this one's been more interesting. Uh, read that to me, pain in the butt. Um, uh, we found some exposure to bedrock that we knew existed, but uh, we found some that we didn't, uh, including one pretty close to the culvert. We found a, a storm drain. We had to work with the city to come up with a solution, which turned out to be maintain as is. Uh, it's still, uh, we hope to have most of the construction on that one completed uh, by the end of this week. Um, there will be some ground cover work um, done immediately, some seeding and stuff for erosion control. Uh, there will be some plantings that will occur in later in the year. Uh, we want to make sure that the, precip the precipitation occurs in time to help those get established and so forth. Uh, both sides are looking really good. We're hoping uh, we'll go out there and uh, see some big fish moving through. Uh, one of the things I found interesting is we did some, when we did the fish salvage at Ellendale, uh, we found a few steelhead. We found a ton of shiners. We found a ton of sculpin, a ton of, let's call them pumpkin seeds, but there were some charters of some kind. Uh, on a couple uh, smallmouth bass, um, all below the dam there. So a little bit of everything as you would expect in warm water. You go up to the next site, we found some shiners, and that's basically it. And so that blockage at Ellendale was pretty was preventing almost everything even from getting up to there. Um, so it was, in, in some ways, that was really interesting. So that's it. It looks good. And if uh, this fall, when the waters are flowing, I recommend you go look. And hopefully we get a nice 
two-year event, none of these five to 20-year events on the first year. Um, even though it's supposed to be able to hold up to it, it's always nice to get just a mild high flow to start. Okay. Um, Francis coordinated your report for the um, so the fall because it's uh, hopefully there'll be salmon moving up the river there's a lot of events happening and part of which are connected to the uh, watershed exploration days and Lori do you want to hand out talk a little bit hand out maybe those posters so the watershed council has worked with a lot of different partners including North Mountain Park and Soil and Water Conservation District to kind of bring together all these folks in the whole basin that do uh, fish and water quality related work because we all do a lot of stuff related to the salmon run. So the Watershed Exploration Day, it goes beyond just Bear Creek, but there's several different events, lots of classes related to water resources, and so we're trying to promote it on a broad, uh, in a broad way to address the population in the whole basin, not just not just those people in Ashton who want to go to the salmon festival and, and do, you know, bring their four-year-old to do something, you know. <laughs> We're trying to get a wider group. Yeah, so, in a way, it's sort of what the, the new road Watershed Council will be looking to do, so um, including across the entire basin events and all the way to even the middle road. So we're just looking at doing the same amount of work, but with the broader area. So please, um, if you are doing an event, just post it at um, and plug the next one. Um, so post this at your office or wherever the event is taking place, and then um, if you are giving a presentation, just plug the next one. So that's how you can support it. So the, the big events that are happening on this on September 27th. There's a river cleanup on the Rogue, and also there's a cleanup at Bear Creek as part of National Public Lands Day. And then there's the Bear Creek Salmon Festival at North Mountain Park in October. The um, Bear Creek Watershed Council, OSU Extension, and the Bear Creek Watershed Education Partners are doing uh, an event in Bear Creek Park. So we're doing our kind of Medford version. Um, and hopefully there'll be fish come, because last year there was salmon coming through the park at that time. So you could walk to the creek at Bear Creek Park, see Chinook moving up the creek so that's the idea is we're trying to show people in the basin that we live in salmon habitat there they are coming up to spawn um, and just kind of generate understanding about that so is your bear creek thing going to happen october 4th as well no that's oh. october 18th oh, so if you on the agenda so that's called kids and ah, creeks definitely. and we partner with medford parks and rec um, and we have some other folks uh, who are helping RV Cog, Freshwater Trust, OSU Natural Resources, Rachel Whirling, and works. So basically, it's Rachel, Rebecca Slosberg from the Bear Creek Watershed Education Partners. The three of us kind of put that together and drag okay, drag others in. Yeah. Add one little thing that is that if, it, if we haven't contacted any of you guys and you're interested, it's the idea is we want to build this into more of a community supported thing in the way the Simon Festivals really successful in Ashland. I think there's great potential at Bear Creek Park. So if anybody would like to participate in that event, have a booth for part of the day or an activity, just contact one of us and let us know. We'd be happy to have you help. And uh, other than that, there's a riparian planting at Coyote Trails also listed. So, um, can, I, can I plug, I just for what it's worth, the very first event, or second actually event, I guess there was something with warm composting, but um, it says tour Medford, Medford's water treatment plant, that's tomorrow. It actually is more than that. It actually is a tour that we take we take people up to the Big Butte Springs, um, which many of you have heard that name for years but don't know where it is, um, what it is. Um, it's the primary facility that provides drinking water for the majority of this valley. Um, and then we, uh, it's, it's nearly a, a full day event. Um, and then we do go to our treatment plant on the Rogue River after that. I do have a few seats left. Um, there's a few people who've been that went to the last one. That's mm -hmm. great. You can say, and yeah, I, I know that. It's, it's, so, it's for those of you, if, if somebody might have tomorrow open, um, it does take all day. But if I do have a few seats left. If someone is interested in going, I think you would find it interesting and to see. Um, it's, it's it's kind of eye opening, I think, for, for people to realize what it takes to get water to come out of your tap. So, anyway, and two very different facilities. So, anyway, see me after the meeting if you're interested in attending. 
Okay, we'll get started with our networking partner reports. Um, I'll just remind you to try and keep them to three minutes and we should get out of here on time. We almost always do. So starting with Trevor, do you have anything for OF Small Grants or the Freshwater Trust? Uh, sure. I could say that the last um, grant window is going to be open the latter half of this month, 16th through 30th. We have $7,500 left, so probably one grant would probably take up all that, or maybe there'd be a couple, but that's what's available. And so that's the small grants um, update. And then the Freshwater Trust is kind of more of the same, I suppose. Not too many new projects going on. I think Eugene had mentioned Lone Pine Creek and Neal Creek and uh, Wagner Creek. Looks like in the last uh, meeting, so kind of still plugging away at those. Uh, John Ward. Uh, a couple of uh, normally our dinner meetings are on the third Wednesday in a month. Um, this uh, year we've had to change the September one to Tuesday. So anybody who comes to that uh, dinner meeting. Uh, it'll be Tuesday, September 16th. The speaker is uh, Whitney Gould, a uh, distinguished uh, spaycaster from uh, London, and uh, she'll be having a pay event, uh, if you want, out on the river to uh, get her personal uh, introduction to uh, death spaycasting. Um, we're involved in uh, suction dredging and uh, we natural gas concerns. Uh, at a statewide level. Locally, we're participating, continues to participate in the site channel uh, activities at uh, this Coyote Trails now. And uh, several other projects going on with uh, the Watershed Council. And we expect to be at the Kidson Creeks on October 18th. It'd be helpful to know how many people are going to show up, but I imagine you're all interested in that. You're wondering how many kids are going to show up or how many adults? Well, uh, there are several things we could do. One would be uh, adult casting. We're normally set up to only uh, take care of youngsters. But uh, if you think that the uh, Monday casting on the lawn that we've been doing uh, has paid off, we'll probably have some adults that are interested, uh, male and female, in uh, uh, improving their own casting. Should we talk think, about that? Sure. Okay. Yeah, like question on, on that, but also in general with all these things. What come, two years ago we did Latino kids in bugs here, and I thought that was pretty successful. So was this is this is changed. It's morphed. What it used to be was kids had to register. We moved them on a bus. Now it's yeah. just an open community event. So there will be it, kids and adults. So that's what we want to appeal to. We don't want to. We're not just trying to hit a small school age group now. Um, so this is the get, morphine. And, and to give you an idea, we would get, at the, the last several years, at least since I've been involved in it, we would get like 30 kids come for this quite a bit of effort. We figured that we had about 140 contacts last year in this new model that's reaching out to the community. And I think that there's a, a really great potential in Medford of people who aren't aware that we have 17 right after Barrett Creek Park. So, we're still doing that um, school outreach, but it's not specific, like getting the kids to sign up before and come. Oh, no, you meant the question was, will, will there be a way to encourage the Latino community with, are there anybody, will there be anybody at any of the events that like speak Spanish or anything like that? That's all I was Well, right. We're not, I mean, we are reaching out to those audiences also, and I, I speak Spanish, well, so great. we're, but we're not just putting that huge focus into yeah. that. We are still reaching out to that community, but okay. we're hoping to make it a broader thing as well. Good, thanks. And we did get in the uh, Parks and Rec um, fall. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah. so I'll, I'll just do that or that um, Anything from Rogue Valley Audubon, Jeff? No. Um, Francis wanted to talk for Dan Van Mike couldn't make it today from ODFW. I just wanted to say that um, there was the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife Commission was considering eliminating uh, two positions in the Rogue District. Well, Jay Duino's position 
and they were and they were going to re reassign Pete Samarin. Um, and actually, a lot of us wrote letters, including this Watershed Council, and actually the commission reconsidered. And Mike Finley, I heard, was very uh, important in how they uh, moved their money around, and those positions will remain as is. So, and I can circulate a letter we got back from the um, the director. So, yeah, um, just the end of August. Obviously, very important for our basin. Those people here. Um, Steve, why update? Um, I got a message on Friday. Bureau of Reclamation, who's been working on the scope of work, is officially uh, beginning to work on the feasibility of NEPA for the piping component of WISE. So the funds are in place, scope of work's in place. They've got uh, their contractor in place for some of the engineering. Uh, this. I've been told it's a 12-month process, but since the two-week scoping process took four months, uh, I'm expecting it to be closer to 18 to months to two years. But at the end of the process, and it, this is official feasibility scoping, it'll go through the public scoping and all that. Um, also, the, the cost-benefit analysis will be done at uh, the end of October. Um, I hope to give a presentation on that here as well, uh, some of the details. Anything else for the Niagara Water Commission? I'll pass. Um, I'll just say for Rogue Valley Sewer Services, I think I mentioned this last month, but we're having a workshop on next Monday morning on low impact development. Um, stormwater features, operation and maintenance, so the rain gardens, stormwater swales that you see around town. This training is specifically targeted at landscape contractors and people who maintain those features to make sure that they're actually properly working and properly maintained because a lot of them go in and then they get forgotten about and so we need to make sure they're actually working. So we're having that training. And then we're doing a hazardous material spill response training in October. That's uh, I actually just got um, the Metro Fire Chief is going to come as well as someone from ODOT in Portland, and that's going to be targeted at public works crews. So that training we're putting on. Um, so that's all for me, John Roberts. Uh, a couple things. Uh, the Water Resource Commission is really focused on. Uh, off-stream storage sites around the state and identifying potential opportunities for more off-stream storage. And the, uh, the governor and his natural resource director, which Richard Whitman, have just uh, appointed and, uh, in, in fact, activated what we call the Peak Seasonal Flow Task Force. There's been two studies done in the last year on the science and the economics of peak seasonal flows. And now we're bringing that all together, and we want that task force to make a recommendation on how much water you can pull out of a, of a stream or river at, at peak flows for off-stream uh, storage. And the thinking is it's probably going to be in the area of 15%, somewhere in that range. But uh, I hope this comes before the you know, Water Resource Commission for final rulemaking. Uh, maybe in early January. It's about six months late right now. It was supposed to be done in uh, July or July 1, but the, the governor and his natural resource director had not even appointed the task force by then. So we'll, we'll see. But I think it, in the light of uh, you know, climate change or whatever you choose to believe, uh, less water, uh, it, it's super important for us to try and get out ahead of this thing. Uh, OWEB, uh, as you all know, is continuing to encourage uh, consolidation among its watershed councils, or at least collaboration. So this group down here is really looked at as kind of the, uh, the leader in that uh, area, and uh, a lot of interest in, uh, uh, in, you know, in getting more of this done. Uh, OWEB. I missed it in its July meeting in uh, the Dalles, uh, finalized some uh, changes in, in the grant process where 
now people that get grants will be required to submit more detailed uh, information about how the grant, uh, how it all worked out. So we had a lot of blank spots to give money out and then, you know, that kind of all went away. But now we're asking for feedback. Uh, and the, uh, the grant applications that, that were submitted in April uh, will be reviewed for approval at our August, uh, October meeting in the grants pass. And I'd like to say it's it is good for local people to show up at OEP meetings. So they don't come often to our basin. So if you can go to the OEP meeting, even just a part of it, to the comment session, to the social time, to say hello to the director Tom Byler or any of the board members, it is very good to go. I should make an announcement there too. Uh, Phil Ward, who was the director of the. Uh, Water Resources uh, Department uh, took a position as the, uh, the, the leader or the head of, of the USDA office in uh, Oregon. So that opened up the, the directorship. Uh, Tom Byler, who is the head of uh, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board uh, Department, uh, was nominated by the governor to take over water resources since he had worked in that department for about nine years, mostly with the legislators. So um, that all has to go in front of the Senate for confirmation, I think, on the 16th of this month. So, uh, so Byler might leave. Byler will move over to water resources. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but he'll leave and then, uh, okay. Many of you know Maida Lofts Garden, is the, the, the deputy at uh, OWEB. She has also been nominated to take over uh, Tom Byler's job. So stay tuned about the middle of the month to see if that all moves forward. <coughs> if it does, uh, that will all become effective October 1st. Okay. Um, is there anything from RV Cog? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, Bear Creek Recurring Restoration Project that some of you have heard about and been involved with. Uh, we're going to start actual activities uh, regarding removal of blackberries probably sometime in late September. We've been working with Roger and Ryan Chotun from the city and ODOT and uh, Jim Hutchins from Oregon Stewardship and other folks to get that going. Um, so we will be seeing signage along the Greenway between M Street and McAndrews Road, uh, letting you know what we're going to be doing, when we're going to be doing it. Uh, there was an article that came out in the ODOT uh, newsletter. Yeah, that was good. Good press. And yeah, you got a Friday. QR code there. Did you see that? That goes to your website. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That came out last week. Alerted people and had a little bit of a schedule in there on what's going on. So for the next uh, about 18 months, we'll be doing some work in there to remove blackberries and other invasives, get some plantings done in that area, and then maintain those plantings uh, over, you know, through the summer of 2016. So that's a pretty ambitious project. Hopefully, it will we'll, uh, get some uh, benefits for the fish benefits for the stream and also uh, a little bit more conducive for people to use along the greenway. Uh, personnel wise, uh, RV COG, um, we lost our uh, water technician, water sampling technician here in July, Kelly Miller. Uh, we've selected a person, a uh, former OSU or former SOU uh, student. Uh, she'll be starting work in late September. Her name is Kim, so you'll probably be seeing her as she gets involved in the activities. Um, and I think that's about it. We're going to be involved in the September 13th Watershed Festival up at Eagle Point. We'll have a booth out there helping a little bit Watershed Council for us. Thank you. Kate, is there anything from DQ you'd like to share with us? Um, I don't think so, actually, yeah. I, I didn't come representing the, the, okay. the, the Vermont Point Source, source Group. I was, I was uh, attracted by the report. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
um, OSU Extension. Okay. Um, we are uh, partnering and participating in a lot of these fall festivals, kind of salmon awareness, so we can be free from that before. before. We'll be also up at Little Butte um, and the Salmon Festival in the spring. We're also partnering with the Salmon Watch Project, which every cloud got funding through Soil and Water, and that's lining up really well. Um, teachers have been signed up, uh, instructors have been lined up, and we'll, um, it's possible that we might even use that involvement with that site uh, there at the American Restoration. And then we also have our Streamwise program, which is the OLED funding, and we have, um, that's an uh, elementary education program. Mostly that portion of it is also, gets kids involved at restoration sites, so there uh, will be partnering with a lot of different sites around here, a lot with Loma Conti. And then the, kind of the thing that I'm personally most excited about is our student monitoring program is really going on with that additional funding again through soil and water for this student watershed assessment team. So we're starting with that uh, this afternoon. Mickey Del Piso and I at Loma Casa are going to go up to Loma Pine and kind of vet the site. And so that what we want to do photo points and we'll be taking kids out there on the 17th from Lobos. And we're also going to work with Julie Marie, who will be at North, um, and work with some first students and be throughout the year going to these different restoration sites and kind of getting going, having kids really uh, doing some rigorous monitoring that we hope can actually be incorporated into reports. So that's what this year will be our first big pilot of that program. What did you say your first project, it was before Streamwise, you said the yeah. Salmon Watch Salmon or Watch. just partners? Okay. So, uh, Rachel, yeah. I, I love that, that you're trying to actual provide real research that's usable. Do you have any track record or feedback yet from anyone on has the data been used and how's, how's it worked out? Uh, well, so far the most, kind of the, the biggest thing that we've been doing is the photo points. And we have Lomakotsi is adopting those and using some, you know, we're incorporating those, those data. This year we're, uh, we're partnering, I mean, collaborating with the Freshwater Trust and getting their protocols and so looking at their vegetation transect. So in terms of doing more detail, this will be kind of a year of, of trying to prove ourselves in terms of gathering that data. But the photo points definitely are working out. It's, it's neat to see how that works even with younger kids. You just, you know, the, the field process is a lot different, so it's less efficient than going out there with a couple of adult technicians, but the ultimate results this great partnering of kind of, I describe it as feeding a need with a need. The students get this hands-on field science and career exposure and the monitoring, there's just such a huge need for monitoring. Um, and there are some really great examples of this kind of thing being really successful. I don't know how many of you guys might be familiar with this program in Springfield. It's been going on for 15 years and they have a great track record. So we're kind of trying to emulate them. And, and well, I, I'm very optimistic about the possibilities, but this is the first year we'll be doing it in a really serious way. Um, so we have Redford. I don't have anything, but I'll use my time to ask a question on Rachel. Um, <laughs> where on Long Pine are you monitoring? Um, you know, I'm going up to the site for the first time. It's uh, a, it's this uh, blue sky grant for the uh, restoration. So it's, 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 up, it's by the park, it's by the, you know, at Cascade Christian. Oh, that's that, that. So up from the park there. Um, so up from Table Rock Road. Table Rock to Biddle? Uh, yeah, not that whole section, but yeah, there's a there's a small section there. Okay, thank you. And then <coughs> we're hopefully going to be implementing um, near the airport in Long Pine, so maybe some more monitoring that corridor, not long enough. City of Ashland? Uh, nothing much. Encourage people to come check out the Bear Creek Salmon Festival on uh, October 4th in North Council Park. Um, are you hooked up to Medford Water? We are. Yeah. Yeah. Their water is amazing. Yeah, like with our water. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> and they made it through. They made it through the drought. Yeah. Yeah. Without yeah. actually having to compose official yeah. uh, official curtailment, they had cuts of about 30 percent. Um, without actually any, you know, saying how to do it. Interestingly yeah. enough, we yeah. saw a shadow effect. We probably had, had reductions of about 15% this summer. Despite the hotter weather, our peak days were lower. Um, and we didn't, 
you know, we, we weren't, we, we never, we weren't going to cry wolf when we didn't have, when there was no wolf, but we also said there was never a good time, you know, it's a good time to look at what, how you're using the water. And so we still promoted it, and we were actually almost scratching our head at how, how much different difference it seemed to make. You know, and I think it was a lot of it, because they knew everybody else was having problems. People reacted. So, I know your, your reductions were 30%, which is pretty impressive, mm -hmm. without ever actually having to say, you've got to do it. Was that man done? Voluntary procurement. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I'll, I'll, you're wrong. Yeah. Um, did you, have you guys received any feedback or news or whatever about uh, the drops on it? From the community? Um, I'm not sure. I actually didn't attend the drop summit, but um, I could, uh, our, con our conservation specialist would probably be the person to ask you. Sure. So, okay. I didn't know. I haven't seen any feedback, but she's okay. probably been collecting it. Thanks. Okay, so water. Okay, so we're having, uh, we have a really great program called the Land Stewards, and that is a partnership with OSU. It's a model program where uh, you can enroll if you own land and you want to get a, a plan. And you work with uh, soil and water representatives to get a plan on your property. So it's kind of a neat partnership. A lot of tours and learning actually from each other. So you learn to, um, from other people you go to their property. But anyway, it starts um, September 11th. So um, enrollment takes very quickly. But if you know anyone, please take a flyer and share, um, share this really great opportunity. And it's urban and rural, so we can go. And it's not just for people who own land, but interested, because I've been recommending it to some people who don't, aren't property owners, but have a lot of interest. Yeah, it's really great. They cover all the, you know, different topics, and they're from experts. So um, the other thing we've got uh, three new staff. So Clint um, is going to be our new planner, and uh, we have a new outreach person named Jennifer Sautel, and uh, also a marketing person that is. Uh, Action parrot. So there'll be three new things that you might see around at the different events. Just so you're having a marketing person and an outreach person are separate people, separate positions? Yeah, we actually decided on going with a part time uh, branding marketing person. <coughs> and so she's able to make videos and a lot of other things. Okay, anything from the Road Basin Partnership? Section? I'm going to let Robert take it because now he's the oh. interim board chair. So. <coughs> yeah, there's a lot going on actually. Um, the Road Basin Partnership, a lot of you probably know, it's, um, it's a newly developing coalescence of people that, uh, I guess the best way for me to explain it uh, is a byline that we're kicking around right now, which is um, helping to manage our water resource from summit to sea stack so it's a group that's um, started with the road basin coordinating council but really I think that's in the name the whole concept is to bring people together watershed councils to be sure but also other folks uh, interested in managing watershed areas and water resources like irrigation districts and could be business owners or agricultural people or water commissions and, and so on and um, it's just being developed right now so we're, we're, we're developing ourselves and uh, it's very busy right now as we do that um, we have several meetings lined up to kind of learn and define where, where do we go from here and how is all this going to work and um, I'm hoping that it's going to go very well and dovetail just great with what the, the um, road uh, four watersheds here that you're working on. And that'll be a big part of it. And in Francis, I don't know what else to mention at this point. Well, so right now we have an interim board. I'm actually on the interim board. Um, and so the idea is that by January or so, there will be a more permanent board. It, it's almost it's very confusing because we our timeline is very similar to the merged councils but the idea with the road basin partnership is that it's much broader um, in viewpoint and and parties than just the watershed councils uh, the merge councils so there will be uh, lots of room for people who want to get and organizations who want to get involved in the, the whole basin viewpoint 
And I guess I would only add that part of the reason for that is because we all feel, and I think most people here do too, that um, the road basin is pretty unique. And I know every basin likes to say that, but we are, guys. That's why we're here. And it would be nice to bring in interest, funding, and energy from outside of the area and have them help to uh, take care of the basin. So it's looking, looking out further out. By that I mean further out in Oregon and further out in um, the types of people that really get into or care about our water resources. So that's <coughs> something. Okay. Any other comments or announcements from anybody? Yeah. Oh. No, go ahead, Craig. Go ahead. Um, I guess the Gold Hill Irrigation District. I took this opportunity because I was really interested in the wetlands and what they had done and how that had happened and to kind of uh, update everybody about what has happened with our Gold Hill Irrigation uh, turning off of the water. Uh, everyone, the board can't ever seem to give any other patients any of the uh, information they need about who is the public person that we need to get a hold of. And everybody that we talked to down at uh, with all these different entities has said to talk to Mr. Tuss. And I did talk to him on the, um, on the phone and he gave us some information. But the one thing that we couldn't get, glean from the uh, Go to the irrigation board again. Yeah. Was who is the project manager? Who do we go to to get the information? There's been some changes that we, we had a special meeting on Saturday, and a few patrons were um, aware of it and they showed up. And there's been a, a big, big change in plans now. We are going supposed to be getting our water back on a week from today, and uh, so they're only going to be doing a partial. Uh, I guess procedure phase of it, where they're just going to be putting 500 feet of the um, the pipe that they were going to be doing a thousand of to begin with. And even at that, when we've done the car calculations, this is going to run into a false positive. We're getting a lot of flow for 500 feet, but the farther on down the river, after the calculations have been done, it's not going to give us our water. And we need to talk to the project manager. Um, it, I know that you said you were project manager. That is just for the funding, finding the funding. Who would you know who the project manager of this of this operation, the diversion project is? Well, um, Pat Smullen, your, who left the board, he was uh, representing the board in terms of applying the OWEP to get funding for the project and OEFW to work with them. Um, I'm. I'm not sure because, like you say, we we were providing assistance to the board to deal with uh, physical and you know getting the contractor on and everything else like that. But um, not sure. If, if you have a question about water resources, you probably want to probably need to keep on talking to Travis Kelly. And, and hi, I don't know this person. Travis Kelly. Travis. Oh, okay. yeah. he's, he's a person that turned me on to it. Said no. If there's any questions that can be answered, Craig does can answer them. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Yeah, it really depends on what kind of questions we have. Yeah, the questions that I was asking him, I was putting out there. He was pointing yeah. to it. You know, general questions I'll try and uh, answer as many as I can, and, you did, and I will okay. refer you to other people if you have questions about water coming into the ditch now after the pipe after the project has been have phase one of the project has been completed not being adequate uh, you know I guess I would talk to them about what your water right is and and other things like that for the, the diversion and go from there I would think Travis Kelly is the one you need to see uh, I, I did yeah. yes I've been there to his office twice and it was not very helpful uh, and again he turn me on to uh, Craig Tuff so that he could, he would be the person to talk to. Well, and I think your, sounds like your, qu your set of questions have changed since you talked, since I talked to you last week. Again, if they you're, have. if you're concerned about when, when the project gets completed to a point where the canal is rewatered up and you guys don't think that you have enough water going into the canal to service the uh, facility, then I think 
when John said that's probably when you to talked to John about or talked to Travis that's about that particular set of questions. Yeah, Larry Mentier is another contact over there. Who is the district? Water master. But as far as anybody knows, there is no project manager for this particular thing except for the board. It's a, yeah, it's the board. That's pitiful. It's scary. Because they yeah, yeah, scary. Because they can't give us any information. All they could tell at the meetings, they just say, "What do you want me to do?" Ah. <laughs> okay. Any other? Did yeah. you have something else, Craig? Well, no. I, <laughs> I'll go back to the comment I was going to make. I'd like to thank Charles and Eric and Robert and Dalton. Uh, he left though, but those folks really made it easy for me to, as a lead for the monitoring effort, along with people like. Uh, Jamie and, and folks from S, uh, from OSU and, and other groups to uh, pull together a monitoring effort for removal removal of Gold Ray Dam. We had to do it quickly. We didn't have a lot of time. Uh, and as usual, monitoring is one of the things that always gets forgotten about. As soon as the project's complete, usually people look for ways to cut funding. And so monitoring is still there and it gets cut. It happened to us twice uh, on this particular project. Um, these three folks and myself, we're here today as volunteers. We're no longer getting paid by the funding from monitoring Gold Ray Dam removal to do any of this work. So I appreciate their passion, their interest, and their endurance to keep know come up with the recommendations and findings and also provide them to folks like yourself so thank you guys yes um, I just wanted to provide a brief um, update on our monitoring at Gold Ray Dam okay um, I'm with the Klamath Bird Observatory these guys have mentioned that a few times this morning um, we were able to monitor birds and vegetation one year before and two years after dam removal and just recently got funding to write a report on that. So we're really excited about that. We're gonna have results out from that at the end of this month, the draft is due. So there are some effort reports for the work that was done that are available on the website right now, but nothing actually about the findings. So that'll be coming out this fall. Um, I've been anecdotally spending time out there um, in the third and fourth year post removal and definitely what we're what's going to come out from our initial report of results on terrestrial birds and vegetation in the first two years isn't much of a change but in my experience anecdotally there's a lot still going on out there and that's what these guys were showing today as well so we're definitely hoping to go back in and continue monitoring in years five and six and then again ten and eleven so we'll see what happens out there over the next decade yeah, I think it's significant. Uh, you know, we haven't seen anything that higher than a two-year event come through the river since the dam's come out. So um, we we expect to see continuing changes to the system, as Robert and Charles and, and uh, Eric mentioned. It's a dynamic system. It's going to continue to change. And if we can get some monitoring years out, decade out, or more, that would be good. Else yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, I can steal another minute, that uh, the, the Freshwater Trust, we, through our work with the Bureau of Reclamation, um, we're doing about 18 acres of restoration work within the Fair Creek watershed. It's riparian restoration as, <clears throat> as well as in-stream work, but uh, I was kind of overseeing the, the riparian restoration work, and we put out a request for qualifications that maybe some of you have seen. Yeah, and uh, I just thought I'd, I'd clarify. So we have about eight different project elements that we're trying to get people to um, put in for. They submit their qualifications for one or multiple of those project elements from you know cattle fencing to project planting and, and maintenance. And then uh, once you're inducted into the pool, we'll submit RFPs or uh, request for proposals and, and solicit bids and then work work with whoever's in that pool. So 
the uh, applications for the request for qualifications are due at the end of this week. So if any of you are interested in, in seeing that or uh, applying for it, let me know and I'll pass you the uh, needed information. So just wanted to make an update. Anything else? Okay, thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you all for coming. And again, if you guys have any more questions for about the roller radium and the blessing, hopefully Craig and Eric and Charles are all sitting around.